Hi, welcome to the pre snore History Hub. This is our first Cold War content video, so that's paper two for us. Um, and it's all about the origins of the Cold War, so how the Cold War started, basically. So what actually was the Cold War? So a hot war is a conflict in which actual fighting takes place, whereas a Cold War is a war waged against an enemy by every means short of actually fighting each other. OK, so we're talking about a rise of tensions, increased arms. However, they're not actually physically directly fighting each other. The expression was first used to describe the frosty atmosphere that developed between the superpowers in the years following the end of the Second World War. So when we say the superpowers, we mean the USSR or Russia um, and the USA. So the Cold War officially started at the end of World War II, so 1945 to 46, and lasted for over 40 years. It was a psychological type of war. And at first it was confined to Europe. But during the 50s and 60s, it spread into Asia and then worldwide as the superpowers competed for influence or control over newly independent states, um, including those in Africa, too. The Cold War had nearly all the features of a hot war. So it had causes and consequences. Uh, there was two sides, so East versus West or the USA and its supporters versus the Soviet Union and its supporters. There were two rival armed camps, so NATO versus the Warsaw Pact, which we'll learn more about in a later video. And the two sides competed for influence all over the world, so often assisting rival sides in civil wars, such as the conflicts in Korea in 1950 to 53 and Vietnam in the, mainly in the 60s, which we already know about. However, the two superpowers did not ever directly fight each other. So this diagram just shows you and outlines some of the main key features of the Cold War. So we've got spying at the top. So both sides spied on each other, mainly to find out any kind of military developments, uh, whether they use spy planes. Uh, so one example was that America used something called the U-2 spy plane, which could fly high enough to avoid being shot down by Soviet fighters. And spying increased the rivalry between the two sides. So both sides used propaganda to create the worst possible image of the other side and ensure that national public opinion supported the government. Uh, the Soviet Union even used success in sport, especially the Olympics, to illustrate the superiority of the communist system. Uh, the arms race, so this is a really key, important one. There was competition in conventional weapons as well as nuclear weapons. So each side wanted more weapons and newer technology um, than the other one. So by the 1960s, both sides had enough nuclear weapons to destroy each other many times over. So this is something that we call mutually assured destruction or MAD or MAD theory. In reality, this acted as a deterrent against war, although it did not stop each side from trying to develop even more advanced nuclear weapons. And again, we'll do another video on the arms race to discuss that in more detail. There was also the space race. So each side competed for success in the space race. At first, it was to launch the first satellite, then the first man in space, and finally the first man on the moon. Successes in this field was, again, very effective propaganda for both sides, so both the USA and the Soviet Union. And then finally, loans and aid. So each side competed to provide loans, so an aid in money or any other things that were needed, to less developed and often newly independent countries in order to win their support in the Cold War, so to, to get more countries on their side, basically. So why did this Cold War actually start? So there's something that we call ideological differences. So an ideology is a set of opinions or beliefs, often kind of political opinions, that are held by a group or an individual. So the Cold War started between the two superpowers because of these ideological differences. So this meant that America held, held one set of beliefs. This was called capitalism. And the USSR or Russia uh, held a different set of beliefs known as communism. So capitalism and communism are two very different, some people say completely opposing, uh, sets of beliefs and ideas. So when did these differences actually emerge? So superpower rivalry was not new. The differences and this rivalry go back to what we call the Bolshevik Revolution or the Russian Revolution in 1917. So the Bolsheviks, led by a man called Lenin, seized control of the Russian government in 1917. And over the next couple of years, by the 1920s, they had established a communist government. They believed in world revolution. And this meant that for communism to be truly successful, it was spread around the world. It's made America and the West, who were very capitalist, 
feel very threatened. OK, so let's find out what actually were communism and capitalism then. So communism is a type of government and philosophy, and its goal is to form a society where everything is shared equally. So that means all people are treated equally and there is little private ownership. In a communist government, people should not have property and there should be no kind of classes within society. So no kind of middle class, upper class, working class, etc. There should also be no oppression or exploitation and people should be free. So somebody called Karl Marx is considered the father of communism. Marx was a German philosopher and economist who wrote about his ideas in a book called The Communist Manifesto, which he published in 1848. So Marx described these important aspects of a communist government. So they should have no private property, a single central bank, so one central bank controlled by the government, high income tax that would rise significantly as you made more. All property rights would be confiscated. So the government owns property. They dish it out where they see where they deem it to be necessary. No inheritance rights. Uh, the government would own and control all communication and transport. And the government would own and control all education. Farming and regional planning would also be run by the government. So very heavy government intervention. And the government would tightly control labour. So that means the workforce or workers. So the actual results of communist governments have actually been nothing like the theories published by Karl Marx. So that all of those things in red are how a communist government should work in theory. However, the low class people that were supposed to be helped by Marxism were often treated horribly by the leaders of the Soviet government. For example, it's estimated that Soviet Union leader Joseph Stalin had over 40 million people murdered just for the good of the state, as he said. Communist states generally have much less freedom and they prevent the practice of religion, um, order certain people to work certain jobs and prevent people from moving around or moving uh, to other countries. People lose all rights to ownership and the government officials become incredibly powerful. OK, so what is capitalism then? So capitalism is an economic system and philosophy. It's a way of organising an economy so that the things that are used to make um, and transport products such as land, oil, factory ships, etc. are all owned by individual people and companies rather than by the government. So the opposite of what happens in communism. Therefore, in a capitalist society, a small handful of people get very rich. So, for example, those people that own the land and the factories, whilst others, for example, the workers, remain limited in their wealth. Therefore, some people argue that this is a very unfair system because the people who own the land or property make a lot of cash off the back of the hard work of many workers. So obviously the worker is paid a wage for their job, but it's very unlikely that the wage is anything like the wage that is being paid to the owner of the company. And this could create a big divide between the rich and the poor in that country. Uh, this means that there is a society uh, with social classes where people are unequal in terms of kind of their wealth and status. And the people who own the land and property, in other words, the rich, become upper class citizens, whereas the average workers who earn far less money become working class and have less social status. So in a capitalist society, these are the kind of key features of a capitalist society. All property can be bought. So, for example, made private by an individual. You can own your own home, for example. People are free to choose where to bank their money. So there's lots of different banks. People can decide where they want to put their money. Uh, there is limited government intervention in business, so taxes are often lower. People are free to inherit property. So if a parent or um, loved one, wife, uh, husband dies, they can inherit property off them instead of it being absorbed by the government like under communism. The government doesn't own and control all communication and transport, so it can be bought by individuals. So, for example, like the trains in this country, there's different companies. One of them's Virgin Trains that happen to be owned by Richard Branson instead of it being owned by the government. And education is not entirely government run and private schools can exist for those who could afford it. Farming is not coordinated by the government. It's led by individuals who own the farms, who sell produce for profit. So. Is it good or bad? So capitalism isn't all bad. Capitalist societies tend to be a lot more free than communist states because there is limited government intervention in life and people have much more freedom. People have a right to vote and they can choose their own jobs and religion. And some people also argue that capitalism is good because it encourages competition. 
But competition is good because it means that people want to do better. So therefore, standards become higher. So standards become better, basically, better quality product. And the economy, therefore, grows further. But some people also manage to aspire in the capitalist system. Not all remain poorly paid. And this means a worker can, in time, improve and gain better skills and education and move up the ladder. It means that many people want to do well and it contributes to the greater good of the country. Okay, don't forget to subscribe to the Personal History Hub. Thank you for listening.